Hello and welcome to episode 26 of my Kerbal Space Program NASA series. Starting off by unlocking some of the science tiers I've been deliberately ignoring, like nuclear propulsion and unmanned tech. Not going to actually employ nuclear engines except for on my uh, Constellation mission. Just because they, too, they do tend to get a little overpowered. Um, a nuclear engine on a small tank can pretty much get anywhere in the system. Or a large tank, I'm sorry. So, gonna try to avoid that as much as I can. But in the meantime, still has a lot of assembly work to do on the KSS. And this is the what would be the Piers docking module on the Russian side of the KSS. It's my another attempt at a proton rocket. I don't have the right number of stages, but if you go with the proper number of stages in Kerbal Space Program, it tends to be very wasteful, especially with Ferrum. Um, I should qualify that. In Ferrum, it's very wasteful because um, it only takes about 3,500 delta V to get into orbit. And so I'm once again not trying to min-max this thing, but I'm not, trying not to be too wasteful. The Piers docking module is another one of those uh, modules on the nadir point of the ISS in real life, and that's where the Soyuz is docked, typically. Unfortunately, I induced a spin into the station when I bumped it there, so I had to switch over so its uh, reaction wheels could kick back in. It's not manned and not currently... Um, doesn't have remote tech integration. I don't have any antennas or actually even... Uh, unmanned pods on board, but it's still, um, that's why I leave the reaction wheels fully engaged all the time. It just doesn't engage them by default until you switch over to it. And as you might have glimpsed as it was coming up, that long antenna was kind of clipping into the module I was trying to dock. I wasn't quite expecting it to uh, do that. So I was kind of concerned that as I undocked, the colliders would kick in and either the antenna or the docking module or both would just flat out explode. So I decided to wait till we were on the day side, retract the long range antenna. It's got the uh, remote tech dipole engaged or on board, but that's only a 500 kilometer range antenna. So I had to wait till I got in range of a comm satellite or in this case closer to KSC so I could get a signal so I could proceed with my undock. Trying to keep my orbits clean and happy, so go ahead and deorbit this thing. Decided if I follow real life uh, protocol and get a fair distance away from the station before I started burning the engines. In reality, the high velocity gases, particles coming out of that engine, can cause a lot of damage to the space station. That's why they always pull off a distance before. Uh, firing up the main engines. For a change, I thought I'd follow one of my stages in as it disposed of itself in the atmosphere. And engines have extremely high um, temperature tolerances, as they should in um, deadly reentry, so if you can blow one of those up, as I just did, you've got a lot of velocity coming in. Fortunately, it didn't have enough to complete the uh, disintegration of the unit, so Eventually, it just ran out of energy and crashed. A little anticlimactic, but it's always fun seeing stuff burn up. Just to see if I could, I decided to see how much I could slow it down with RCS, which was obviously not enough. Twenty days later, Space Shuttle Intrepid is on the pad, carrying the base of the uh, truss assembly. Which would, this is in real life it's called the P0 truss and it's the part where the uh, two main branches of the truss come off of oddly enough so this is kind of an exciting piece to get installed because that means I can start building out the truss finally so the space station is going to start looking a lot more familiar um, to what its current configuration is nice clean separation as usual But going back to what I was saying about the uh, high-speed exhaust gases from rocket motors, they actually are a consideration to keep, um, to worry about, because 
they they will have an effect on anything they collide with. If anyone's familiar with the rescue mission or the retrofit mission for the Hubble Space Telescope where they removed the old solar arrays and installed a new set, there was a lot of question as to how they would dispose of that safely and they actually used the space shuttle's maneuvering thrusters once the uh, solar array was disengaged from the station or from the telescope geez hunting for the word they moved it in front of the s shuttle and used the forward reaction control jets to kind of blow it away um, so it would not come back and crash back into the Hubble which would be disastrous on any day decided to shake things up a little uh, from my normal routine I'm about four days out from rendezvousing with the station at this point but I decided to go ahead and capture the payload just so that's one less thing to worry about once I've got my close approach coming in took a bit to figure out how I was going to do this but uh, worked out in the end it's kind of an awkward payload to deliver just because it's got um, like I said, it's kind of a weird shape, but kind of on the fly I came up with a what I thought was a pretty decent uh, compromise. And I decided to put lights on the truss base just because I've noticed I don't have any lighting systems actually on the space station itself. And that's going to get annoying in the future. So I'm probably going to be sending up, um, once it's finished, some uh, space shuttle or Venture Star missions that have spare lights on board that uh, I can attach with KAS. Went ahead and showed how I get my really close approaches um, for people who um, might be curious about that. Th all this maneuvering is done with RCS because the OMS system is only for actual orbital maneuvers and in some extreme cases, final braking, getting close to the station. Basically, once I get to a really decently close approach, just start adjusting um, short bursts of the RCS to get as close as I can. Four kilometer or point four kilometers was the best I could manage there, but or I'm sorry, I got it down to point one. And that way I can cover the rest of the distance without firing any more RCS than I need to. Just doing my very best to be as efficient as possible. Switch control to that node. And I don't know what I'm going to do with um, my other truss that you see there with the Gigantor. That's actually supposed to be one of the end trusses for the main assembly, but I'm not entirely happy with the look of it. That's going to require me redesigning pretty much the entire truss assembly, but it's just a couple parts slapped together with uh, solar panels attached, so... I don't know how attached I am to it. Obviously, it'd be a wasted mission um, having flown it up there, but who knows? I'll probably just leave it how it is and fly the rest of them up. But it is kind of nice to actually, want, as I said, to be thinking about the trust for a change because um, it's going to be a... With the base module and three extensions per side with one of those extensions actually already being up there um, that's going to be another five missions devoted just to assembling the truss so once again I don't know exactly how I feel about that I may start they're small enough I can probably pack two trusses um, per shuttle and the more I think about that, it's probably what I'm going to do. Um, just to minimize how many launches I have to do. I love flying the shuttle, but it, as you can imagine, it gets a little tedious sometimes. 
I was trying to be super accurate with my alignment of this because I didn't want the whole truss assembly to be um, off in its orientation. And the further it, I extended out, the more obvious it's going to become. Unfortunately, trying to go, go by the docking alignment indicator, I think I've got the Z1 truss, which is what I've just attached to. Um, it's off by a few degrees because you can see it's not quite as straight as I would hope. So I just said back off and uh, give it another try. This time just eyeballing it, not really looking at the indicator. A little awkward wiggling. But that came out a lot better. It's still maybe a couple tenths of a degree off, but it's not going to be too major. And uh, th I'm happy with that. I, perfection is kind of hard to get in a KSP because with the ma magnetic docking clamp, um, it tends to wrench the ship around however which way it wants. In real life, mechanical docking, um, it's a little more tricky because you have to be exactly on target. And in fact, real life docking speeds are much slower than they are in KSP. We're talking millimeters per second. And after that operation, this had taken me till about midnight. And so I was pretty tired and just decided to park the station up, the shuttle up for a night and uh, come back for the return the next day. Once again, space station is getting rapidly much larger, especially now that I'm dedicating a lot more time to uh, completing it. Intrepid backs away slowly. You see the range extension tanks on board. Did not skip those, and I probably won't ever again. Because I really don't like stealing fuel from the station. Um, it just doesn't feel right to have to do that. I went ahead and showed the entire uh, stair-step maneuver to get down from 250 kilometer uh, orbit down to 100 kilometer orbit, just because um, I don't really show it a lot, and but I talk about it, and so people might kind of be in the dark what I'm talking about when I mention bringing my orbit lower. As I said, I have tried and actually succeeded a few times in Sandbox to get down directly from the station, and it is much more efficient to do it that way. However, um, it's just so hit or miss whether I can actually, uh, one, keep from overshooting the runway, or B, keep from ripping the wings off on a high-speed re-entry. Go ahead and unlock the range extension tanks and pump them into the main tank. And I decided to play around with the Trajectories mod. Um, I've never used it before. In fact, this was the very first time I actually ever have used it. Um, so I was curious if, I, if it would simplify planning a return, and it did a decent enough job. Um, I was fairly happy with it. But once you involve wings and ferromero space, its calculations uh, can stop being too helpful. I had a lot more altitude than I normally did coming in. So it was a little stressful having to go into 40 degree dive with the speed brakes extended um, just to try and put it down. And in fact, I still came in a little high and uh, went ahead and set it down harder than I normally do just, be, just to make sure there's enough runway to get the thing stopped. But all in all, as an experiment, the uh, adding the water purifiers back there definitely... Uh, helped improve the glide aspect. It still falls like a rock, but it's much more controllable. And for the rest of the video, I decided to just play around with uh, some aerodynamic stuff. Decided to test my, try my hand at a super maneuverable plane. And it kind of ends up like a stubby SU-27 with uh, thrust vectoring, which it's a neat little plane. It's uh, one of the more, it is the most maneuverable one I've built in a long time. Um, and 
it can actually handle some pretty good speeds without shearing the wings straight off. But I just want to see how far I could push uh, aerodynamic properties of a plane as far as uh, post-stall maneuvering goes. And uh, was not too uh, disappointed. Plus, as you can see, I finally figured out how to ha make a decent looking uh, twin engine plane. Didn't quite... I'm still not able to uh, make my T-38 twin engine, but uh, been developing some neat, some cool looking jets lately. Because I'm still getting a lot of those aerial survey missions um, and still doing them because they are like the best source of income I can get because I'm using a reusable jet. Um, I can get pretty much all the funds reward from them, and they don't have very high science payouts, so I don't totally uh, negate the need for my space program. But I can pretty much get a decent fundage payout with for just the cost of a little bit of jet fuel, which is always nice, because I'm completely recovering the entire aircraft and the crew. And unless I have a hard landing and knock something off, I, as I said, get the whole thing back. I want to see what the top speed of this thing was, or if it could at least do Mach 2, and it did not disappoint. Mach 2 in a climb was, at low altitude, was quite an accomplishment. But any maneuvering done at this speed would uh, show you just how quickly a plane can fall apart. So I decided to pop the speed brakes before I start testing out a uh, high angle of attack maneuvering. Doesn't have an ejection system per, per se, but uh, at this altitude I can just click Jeb's picture down in the corner, hit EVA, and uh, he'll be out of there. But you can see, large scale, skull, stall, ah, large scale stall, and it's still under control. If the engines were spooled, um, it would be even more controllable because of the thrust vectoring. You can see, I can throw it almost completely backwards um, and still maintain control of the plane. And that was like a very, very high angle Cobra maneuver. Um, the Colbit is where you can take a super, super maneuverable aircraft like the Su-37 or the F-22 um, and basically do a backflip with it. Doesn't have a whole lot of utility in it practically, but it sure is pretty awesome to watch. Lining up for the landing. Probably the best landing I've ever managed in this game. Not bad for something that just got thrown together uh, pretty haphazardly. But all the lessons that uh, went into figuring out how to get this thing to fly decently well led to another aircraft that I'm about to show and actually did an aerial survey mission with it. This is basically if an F-18, an F-14, and a MiG-29 had a really bad mid-air collision and uh, this is just kind of what was left over of it. And I know it's uh, improperly labeled. I've got it called the KFA-18F and F model F-18s are actually uh, two-seaters. So, but. I had a previous version of this one that um, I had labeled E model because the squarish intakes are more F-18 Super Hornet than they are just F-18 Hornet. So, but again, they're not in the right place. It's just wanted to build something that flew well and looked vaguely like uh, a real aircraft. And this is actually the first flight of this particular model. Um, I just took it straight out went for a flight and that's if you saw those wings flex flexing this is the first time I've actually run into a uh, fair aerospace wing flex which was a little distressing a real high-performance aircraft isn't gonna have much in the way of wing flex um, they are gonna move a little bit but it's not gonna be this violent but this thing has some interesting aer aerodynamic capability characteristics um, at low speeds, like, I say low speeds, but at about 300 knots, it had a decent angle of attack on it, but once it got above 500 uh, knots, it becomes very stable aerodynamically.
And this is the first time I've actually l tried to land it, um, and it was a little distressing because it's very good at picking up speed, even when I'm trying not to pick up speed. Had to deploy the brakes to uh, bring it down for a landing. Once again, if you're going to set your, your brakes up correctly, do not leave the brakes on your nose wheel engaged. It tends to make your plane somersault. Be trying something new with this plane and some others I'm going to set out on the tarmac. Just going to bring pilots and fuel out to them on a little truck I'm going to design. Um, just for a little realism. And it's always neat to have jets sitting on the tarmac next to the runway. Um, but I'm not going to go into a whole lot of detail depending on how many people want to see me fly jets in a space game. But next video we're going to be launching Mars Pathfinder. So things are about to get a lot more interesting on the Duna front. Uh, stay tuned and thank you very much for watching.